Patrick Moore discusses our new view of Jupiter from the Pioneer and Voyager spacecraft in The Sky at Night. Good evening. Before I come to my main theme, I think you'd like to hear about some very exciting things that are going on. And the first of these concerns the planet Venus, which you can now see in the western sky after sunset. And you can't possibly mistake Venus. It is so very brilliant. It looks almost like a small lamp in the sky. Remember, it's closer to the sun than we are, and just about the same size as the Earth. Now, this is a drawing I made of it on March the 3rd with the 15-inch telescope in my observatory. Uh, Venus isn't quite full, not all its daylight side is turned towards us, and you can't see very much on its surface, only a few very vague, cloudy markings. And in fact, we can never see the surface of Venus direct, because the planet is surrounded by a very dense, cloudy atmosphere, and we can't see through it. It's always cloudy on Venus. So the only way to map Venus is by means of a radar. And this is being done now by the Magellan probe, which is going round and round Venus and sending back superb radar images. For example, it's showing us magnificent craters. Look at that, well over 50 miles across, with terrace walls and a central peak. And here's another Venus crater. Quite incredible things. And what NASA have done is to make a video from the Magellan results. And so I can now ask you to join me in a flight below the clouds of Venus and over the planet's surface. And just look at those mountains, those craters, those lava flows, a strange, nightmarish landscape. And remember, the temperature there is not far short of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The atmosphere is choking carbon dioxide, and the clouds contain sulfuric acid. So Venus is indeed a strange kind of place. But by the time Magellan ends its career, we should have a really accurate map of the entire planet. Next, Halley's Comet. Do you remember Halley's Comet? It bypassed us in 1986, and it's now a long way away, more than 1,300 million miles. But it can still be followed with some really large telescopes. And the Danish reflector, the observatory of La Silla in Chile, and it's the second dome from the left-hand side, has been used to take a most remarkable photograph of it. And this was taken in February, and it shows that Halley's Comet has suffered an outburst. And you can see there that the, um, the coma over to the right-hand side of that splodge is surrounded by a layer of dust and gas. And this is the last thing you would expect. And just why Halley's Comet has burst forth like that, we don't know. Unfortunately, it's getting further away all the time, and sadly, it won't be back again till the year 2061. And then we've had a very close encounter with an asteroid. As I think you know, the asteroids, or minor planets, spend most of their time between the paths of Mars and Jupiter, so they're a long way away. But there are some smaller ones which swing inwards and may pass close to the Earth. And this happened in January. The asteroid, not yet named, merely known as 1991 BA. And there's a picture of it. Those specks are stars, of course. This was a time exposure. And that trail was left by the little asteroid as it crawled across the plate. And it moved very quickly indeed. It covered seven degrees of the sky in only five hours. So it was close. And in fact, it bypassed us at only about half the distance of the moon. And that's an all-time record. But of course, it's not very big. Diameter, only about 30 feet. So one's bound to ask, can these stray asteroids actually hit us? And the answer is yes, of course they can. But please don't get alarmed. The chances of our being hit by an asteroid, even a tiny one, are very small indeed. In the evening sky at the moment, we can see three brilliant planets. One is Venus, I've talked about that, low in the west after sunset. And then, in Taurus the Bull, we have the red planet Mars. And I discussed that on the very recent programme, so I won't say much more about it now. It's moving away from us, it's fading. You can still see the markings on it. And this was a drawing I made on March the 3rd with my 15-inch telescope, but um, Mars is now well past its best. Not so with Jupiter, which follows all round and round, and is now among the stars of Cancer, the Crab, close to the lovely star cluster of Praesepe. And Jupiter, again, is very bright indeed, brighter than anything else except Venus. And even a small telescope will show its yellowish, flattened disk with its dark belts and, uh, usually, its great red spot. That picture was taken a couple of years ago. 
Now, Jupiter looks bright, not because it's near, it certainly isn't, but because it is large. In fact, Jupiter is much larger than the Earth. As you can see, it makes the Earth look very puny indeed. And um, you can also see there that Jupiter is flattened. And that's because, although it is so big, more than 88,000 miles in diameter, it is spinning round very quickly. It has the shortest day of any planet, less than 10 hours long. And that, of course, makes the equator bulge out. And that's why Jupiter is flattened at the poles, as any small telescope will show. But although it has a short day, it has a very long year, roughly 12 times as long as ours, because it's a long way from the Sun. The orbit of Jupiter is well beyond the asteroid belt, well beyond that of Mars, as you can see there. And consequently of this, Jupiter does come to opposition every year, and um, for several months in every year, we see it well. But what kind of a world is it? Well, it's not solid and rocky in the same way that the Earth is. Its surface is made up of gas, and Jupiter is always changing. It's a world in a state of constant turmoil. And to bring that home, I'd like to show you some of the drawings I've been making myself in the last few months, all with my 15-inch telescope. And there's one I made on September the 13th last year. Uh, in these drawings, by the way, south is at the top, because that's the way you see it in an ordinary telescope. And the main belt there is the north equatorial, just below the center, which is very prominent indeed. And generally, there's a south equatorial belt, but you can't see that nearly so well there. But on November the 6th, things were rather different. The south equatorial belt was coming back, and the Jovian equator was darkening. And then come on now, December the 7th, there it is, and this time we have the great red spot, only it doesn't look red there, and I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Then on to December the 24th, again you can see developments, December the 27th, uh, there again is the, the grey spot at the moment, and also December the 31st. So as you can see, Jupiter is by no means always the same, and we want to find out just why that is so. I mentioned the great red spot. Now that's the most famous feature on Jupiter. It's been seen on and off, more on than off, ever since the 17th century. And in that picture, taken at the Palomar Observatory, you can see the red spot there, above the centre, over to the right-hand side. And that has a rotation period of its own, because Jupiter doesn't spin in the way that a solid body would do. And generally speaking, the equatorial region, that's between the two main belts, has a rotation period of nine hours, fifty and a half minutes, and that's about five minutes less than the rotation period of the rest of the globe. So Jupiter's day is not the same everywhere. And we can measure that simply by watching how the markings are carried across the disk from one side to the other. Because using an adequate telescope, you can see the shift in only a few minutes. Let me show you how it's done. Because Jupiter is so flattened, we always know where this central meridian is. And what is done is to time the moments when various features cross the central meridian. On the north equatorial, there's a notch coming up now. Wait for it. There it is. And once you have that, then you can get the Jovian longitude, and from that, you can work out the rotation periods. And we found out from that, too, that various features uh, have rotation periods all their own. Well, that means that Jupiter is a very different kind of world from the Earth. It isn't a kind of failed star, as used to be thought. It doesn't send out enough heat to light its satellite family, but it is quite unlike the Earth. There's a solid core, silicate core, which is pretty hot, probably something like 30,000 degrees, maybe rather more than that. And that's the most substantial part of Jupiter. And round that, there are layers of liquid hydrogen. Now, the inner part of that layer of liquid hydrogen is so compressed and so hot that it starts to behave rather like a metal. And then, at about 28,000 miles from the centre of Jupiter, where the temperature is still about 11,000 degrees, and the pressure is about 3 million atmospheres, there's a change from that metallic hydrogen into the ordinary hydrogen, which we call molecular hydrogen. And then above that, we come to the atmosphere, and the top of that is what we actually see, something like um, 600 miles deep, and again, it's made up chiefly of hydrogen. And um, that's no surprise, because hydrogen is the most plentiful substance in the entire universe, over 80% in the case of Jupiter, and most of the rest is made up of helium. So, that is the kind of world that Jupiter is. But what about the red spot? Well, as I've said, it's a very familiar feature. 
It's there for most of the time. Uh, there it is again, shown in that Palomar picture. But there are times when it vanishes completely for a bit, although it always comes back. And it has done that fairly recently. But now the great red spot has returned. And this is a drawing of it that I made a few nights ago with my own telescope. And there in the middle of the disk there, you're near on the, on the central meridian, you can see the great red spot. Only at the moment it isn't red, it is decidedly grey. And I've never seen Jupiter's red spot like that before. For a long time, we had no idea what it was. There were suggestions it might be the top of a volcano poking out from inside Jupiter, or it might be the top of a column of stagnant gas. We now know it's a whirling storm, a phenomenon of Jovian weather, if you like. But of course, we weren't certain of that before we were able to send spacecraft past Jupiter and obtain pictures from close range. And that was done in the 1970s with four spacecraft, two Pioneers and two Voyagers. And the first of these was Pioneer 10, which went successfully to the asteroid belt and bypassed Jupiter in December 1973. And there's a Pioneer 10 picture of Jupiter, and there you can see the great red spot very distinctly. Well, a year later, Pioneer 11 went by and also sent back close-range pictures. And you can see the view is not quite the same. And there, of course, not all of Jupiter's sunlit side was turned toward the spacecraft, and therefore Jupiter shows a phase which it doesn't do uh, when you see it from the Earth. But both the pioneers, good though they were, were very much outranked by the Voyagers of 1979. Voyager 1 passed Jupiter in March, Voyager 2 in July. And look at those detailed pictures there. And there again is the great red spot. And you can see the kind of world of constant turmoil that Jupiter is. And when you compare the Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2 views, taken three months apart, remember, as you can see, they are by no means the same. And there are violent winds on Jupiter, and thunder and lightning, and things are going on there the entire time. Also, it's possible to put those Voyager pictures together and make um, a time-lapse video showing how Jupiter spins. And this is what's been done here. And as you can see, there's the red spot coming over. Very much speeded up, of course, because remember, Jupiter does take nearly 10 hours to spin round once. And we can also have time-lapse pictures of the great red spot which is itself spinning round and round and causing a tremendous influence on all that part of Jupiter. It's a very strange thing. And remember, it is big. It can be more than 30,000 miles long. Another thing that Voyager did was to confirm that Jupiter has a ring. Now, that ring can't actually be seen from Earth. It's been suspected from Pioneer. And it's rather interesting to take a genuine Voyager picture and then put the ring around it, but no one's actually seen that. And you certainly can't compare Jupiter's thin ring with the lovely ring system of Saturn. And Voyager confirmed that Jupiter has got a very, very strong magnetic field, much stronger than that of any other planet. And in fact, Jupiter's magnetosphere, and that's the area over which Jupiter's magnetic field is dominant, stretches out until at times it may actually cross the orbit of Saturn, so there are times when Saturn is actually inside Jupiter's magnetic field. And finally, we now know that Jupiter is surrounded by zones of deadly radiation, rather like our own Van Allen belts, but very much more intense. And that means that no astronaut can go close, because any astronaut going within 100,000 miles of Jupiter's clouds would die very quickly and very nastily from radiation poisoning. So Jupiter is a world to be viewed from a very respectful distance. Now Jupiter isn't alone. It has a whole family of moons or satellites, 16 altogether. Now 12 of those are very small, but the remaining four are large, and you can see them with any small telescope. They are known as the Galileans, because they were observed in 1610 by the great Italian astronomer Galileo with his primitive telescope. And here's a page from Galileo's original notebook. And Jupiter's represented there by the open circle, and the, uh, the satellites are represented by star-like points. I um, even know one or two people who can see them with the naked eye, and really good binoculars will show them. But any small telescope will do it. And this picture, by Commander Hatfield, shows them very well. And they are in order. Over to the left, Callisto, and then Io, Europa, and Ganymede. And they look there, of course, like tiny disks. But they are, in fact, large. They're planet-sized. Ganymede and Callisto are roughly the size of Mercury, about 3,000 miles across. 
Io slightly larger than our moon, and Europa only very slightly smaller. And so, in fact, they are really planet-sized worlds, and they are by no means alike. And you can follow their movements from night to night. It's fascinating to do as they move around Jupiter. Sometimes a satellite may pass in transit across Jupiter. Sometimes you'll see its shadow passing in transit. Sometimes a satellite may pass into Jupiter's shadow and be eclipsed. Or it may pass behind Jupiter and be hidden or occulted. And so, if you look at Jupiter through a telescope, and you find that one or more of the big moons is missing, you may be sure that something of that kind is happening. But from Earth, obviously, we can't see much in the way of surface detail. But Voyager sent back magnificent pictures. I like this one, with Io there silhouetted against the red spot, and Europa over to the right. I also like the famous family portrait, put together from various Voyager views, in showing Callisto down to the lower right, and then Ganymede, Europa, and Io. But you know, the members of Jupiter's family are by no means alike, and that was something, frankly, we didn't expect. And the Voyagers got magnificent pictures of all the big moons. Callisto, icy and cratered. Airless, nothing ever happens there. Ganymede, also icy, cratered and airless. Europa, icy and smooth, with no mountains and very few craters. And the real surprise packet, Io, looking rather like an Italian pizza. And it's red, sulfury world, and there are active volcanoes there, erupting all the time. And there's a volcanic plume. But they're not like our volcanoes. We believe that Io has a surface made of sulfur, of which only the top part is solid. And these are sulfur volcanoes in constant action. And so, if you could go to Io, it would be a very strange scene indeed. And those volcanoes are hot. But I'm quite sure that nobody ever will, if only because Io moves right inside Jupiter's lethal radiation zones. Most of what we know about Jupiter and the Jovian family comes from the pioneers and the voyagers. But another space probe is on its way there now, and this is named in honor of Galileo. This is a picture of Galileo before it was launched, one that I took myself from Cape Canaveral. It's made up of two parts, an entry probe and an orbiter. The idea being the orbiter will go round and round Jupiter, and the entry probe will come down into Jupiter's outer gas. But Galileo can't go by the shortest route. Its launcher didn't have enough power. So it's got to go by a rather circuitous path, rather like going from Brighton to Bognor by way of Grimsby. When it was launched, it swung in past Venus, picking up speed. It then bypassed the Earth last December. It's now on its way to the asteroid belt. It'll bypass an asteroid, Gaspar, next October. A further pass with the Earth in December 1992. And then on its final journey out to Jupiter, arriving there in 1995. The two parts will then separate. The orbiter will go round Jupiter, and the entry probe will come down into Jupiter's gas by parachute. The drogue parachute will open, then the main parachute, and finally the probe will come down and, we hope, send back information before it's destroyed. It won't take very long, but it should be absolutely fascinating. And so 1995 is going to be a very important year for Jupiter studies. So meanwhile, don't forget to look at it. It's there now in the sky, high in the south. And even with a three-inch telescope, you can see details on its surface. And remember, Jupiter, the giant of the solar system, is the most important member of the Sun's family and a really intriguing place. Finally, don't forget, if you want the latest news, you can always ring the Sky at Night number 0836 406075. Charges 33 pence per minute cheap rate, 44 pence per minute other times. Or dial CFAX, page 616. And when I come back on March the 31st, I'll have a very important guest, no less a person than the Astronomer Royal. And we'll be talking about cosmic rays. Good night.